Go ahead. Anytime you're ready, Charlie. Okay. You got your button pushed? I do. <laughs> okay. Well, then I just want to say thank you folks for coming back. And uh, But most important is that um, I have a couple of questions for all of you about the week that you have spent uh, every hour of that you could walk, watching birds in Peachum. But, <laughs> but uh, in any case, um, in this, in today, we're going to also challenge you a little bit more to, uh, to with your identifications mm -hmm. and any stories you can tell about any birds that you see on the screen. Don't hesitate, but uh, we'll try to keep the, keep it shorter than it was last last week. But um, the pictures will be recognized, and so I'm. It's one thing I want to do is encourage to hear what you've seen. That's really important. What you've seen and uh, uh, what you saw this week, particularly, and it doesn't need to be an awful lot, but uh, anything would be great. And so the other thing I want to find out from everybody who winds up uh, on this evening's conversation, do they keep a list? Do you keep a list of birds that you see? Do you uh, keep notes of them? Do you keep a journal about it or do you just keep it in your head? And uh, frankly, um, you need the list and you need to prepare a list if you want to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. Well, just the biggest hang up it has um, is that it's not something you just get casually do. You, you can uh, uh, compile some uh, list that you had over these last four days and you can submit it uh, in their format um, by March 1st, but you, you can't just uh, send it when it, the, the only thing, uh, Frank, do you do eBird? You're muted, so I don't know. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I I have an eBird account, but I haven't been I haven't been terribly terribly diligent with it. Yeah. Well, I understand that because uh, uh, I almost never post on eBird, but if I see something that really uh, is something that I want to uh, light up, be, be lit up by and have it, have it there. Um, and uh, I've bumped into some, some opinion uh, ornithologists who didn't have anything to say about what I was posting. Wait a minute, <laughs> Nothing good anyway. From what I'm used okay. to, so. Um, I think this is us right here, show okay. thumbnail video. Yeah. So, who, 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 I'll make the request and- so Maybe you need to go down here. Oh yeah, okay. Usually you can do it in your window, but this is different. There, you did it. If you're not talking about birds with us, uh, please mute, you know how to do that. And then just un unmute as soon as you have something to say about the birds uh, that we're gonna be talking about and uh, watching the birds, which is something we're, we care about. Okay, so um, just to keep rolling along, is there anybody on this call right now uh, who did, who has prepared a list for the Great Backyard Bird Count this year? If you did, speak up, please. Well, th then I, <laughs> we don't have to spend a lot of time on that subject, will we? <laughs> so, hi, Jan. <laughs> um, so, okay, so what I'm going to do then is get us moving, but I would like, if you see a picture on, you, on the screen of a bird that you remember and that you've seen recently, please speak up and say, yes, I saw those and where you are. Well, like I saw, I, I saw five, six, six red crossbills on the ground on the road of Blanchard Hill Road just on Thursday. That's kind of exciting for me. So anyway, okay. So if you see any of these and you remember what they are, uh, tell us what you see. Okay, I'm, let's get going. So remember this picture? Uh, I don't know, well, see the screen. Um, uh, the key, key thing is uh, if, you, if you recognize these birds, I'm not gonna tell you what they are. You're gonna remember what they are, so. <laughs> Right? American goldfish. I've seen them all the time right now. 
they're they're perfect yeah. so so keep those on your on your list in your head or list on a paper or just list and uh, you could scribble it in the snow for that matter but <laughs> but yeah i i sometimes make notes of of what i've seen that is really special like the crossbills but these guys yeah you'll see them every day between now and and uh, next fall okay <clears throat> anybody see any of these <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, if you've seen it, you, you, can, you can just raise hundreds, your hundreds of them. All <laughs> right, that's good. That's good. Really good. Um, yeah, we see about uh, I have about fifteen that hang out at my feeders, and uh, if they're very charming, um, and they're very smart, uh, and they're very desperate for your food, uh, even yeah. though it's not wild food. Um, they we talked about this last week about how desperate they are to sustain their metabolism. And so the tiny birds are like that. And this is one of them. And so is this. Not yeah. Oh, yeah. I, they seem to come for the feeder right with the chickadees. They don't yes. exclude each other. They sure do that. Um, See them all the time. Yep. And which, which, which nut hatch is this? Red breasted. Red breasted. Yeah. Red breasted. It's kind of showing yeah. it off, isn't it? And uh, yeah, I have red breasted nut hatches. They, I mean, I'll be out filling the feeder and they'll come and rest on the feeder waiting for the food to drop in. It's a cylinder feeder and they say, hey, come on, get on with it. And it's these guys. <laughs> and we have a pair of them that um, are also uh, uh, trying to um, create uh, a cavity they can they can uh, live in and nest in and huddle in um, during the cold weather, but nest in coming spring. Uh, they're trying to open up their own uh, cavity in a in sort of a, a a dead limb of a birch tree, and they'll be there all summer, I expect. But the food that I give them is not going to be there all summer. They got to deal it for themselves. Okay, red breasted nuthatch. Good, Charlie. Uh, I have both the white and red breasted, and they seem to be fairly adversarial relationship between the two um, groups. Well, that's a good way to put it. I think that they, yeah, I think <laughs> that they really, I mean, some birds just don't really get on very well, do they? And it, you make, it makes you wonder because the white breasted is a little bit larger. This guy is a little bit more pugnacious. And, um, and so they probably don't just don't get along. So um, speaking of the white breasted, here it is. And uh, yeah, these, this is a very mellow bird compared to the other nuthatch that we can see here. Um, and uh, you remember this guy, uh, it's, uh, they're, very, they're very loud. And uh, I was gonna see, well, I'm not gonna do it, but I was gonna, I have a, on my, on my phone, I have uh, uh, the Audubon app and it has all these guys, all these birds uh, and their vocalizations. And I could play it. I could play the voice of this one at louder than my voice right now, uh, but I don't think you need to hear that. And uh, you probably have a way to listen to the birds of your own. Okay, so yeah, these Carly, guys- Carly, yes. can I interrupt for a second? Please and do. just let everybody know that I dropped the link in the chat for information about the Audubon app, which is available for Android or Apple devices. Great, super. Yeah, so if you look at if you look in the chat, if you click on the little chat uh, button and it brings down a, a list of, of chat conversation comments and if you go to that, you should be able to uh, find exactly what Susan has posted, which is great. Because I have this I have this app in my phone and it's, it's it is an entire, entire uh, North American um, uh, bird of, uh, uh, that better than, a, than a, a book that you'd carry around, really, because it's got the, you can hear the sounds, um, you see the, all the pictures that, that, that are posted, and I really like it. If you want to know more about it, we will have your email, and I'll be able to tell you more about it if necessary, but Susan's posted you for, posted a link of it for you. Okay, so yeah, this looks like tonight, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna want to watch out for the tuft of titmouse when it's at, when it's snowing, right? <laughs> well, this is that's that's the hardy thing of this particular species because these birds are one of the one of the new visitors to new re, new residers in Vermont, um, uh, along a few others that we spoke of last time. And uh, titmice, uh, when I was doing the Christmas bird count 
I've been doing it for 25 years. When I started doing it, we didn't see these for the first decade. And then they started showing up in people's feeders or even in the woods. So, okay. How many of you saw Tuft of Titmice in the last week? Good. Yeah, I think so. definitely. Good, good. Yes, I in Linden. Okay. I see them often in St. Johnsbury. It's been a busy week, so I'm not sure I've even been home in the in the light. <laughs> yeah, well, the, we're happy to have have observers from other towns besides Peachum, but our, our goal was to say, okay, we're delivering this for people, anybody who wants to know about birds in Peachum. So, but we're glad that anybody wants to participate. I mean, you could do this from across the country because you just use the link but I'm not suggesting you do that, Susan. <laughs> okay. Um, and you must have seen these at your bird feeders in the past week. No, I never get them. Yeah, not at the feeders, but on the ground. Well, you sprinkle the food, food on the ground and they'll sprinkle the food on the ground and they'll be there first thing uh -huh. in the morning. Yeah, that's right. Well, I sprinkle it under my, under my bird feeders because the birds are very sloppy and they dump a bunch of stuff out of the feed or onto the ground anyway. So the morning doves are there and a couple of other species are there on the ground exclusively. You're absolutely right about that. You can, you can make it easier for that for them uh, if you want, if, if it's muddy or too deep, the snow's too deep. If you have a, a tray, for example, that you hang from a branch, they'll regard that as another flat surface from which they can feed. A wooden a plank would be great too. They would eat off of that easily, okay? All right, so I'm glad people are seeing morning doves and I'm glad you're hearing them too. It's such a wonderful sound they make. And as, as I mentioned last week, this is another bird that, um, how many of you saw these this week? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right, all right. Uh, so you were looking for them, weren't you, Lydia? Yes, I was, <laughs> they, and they finally came. Well, that's good, that's good, because they'll, they'll, they won't be far away uh, uh, for, forever, for as long that's as they're great. alive. Well, you don't always see them though, because they're no. also kind of shy, but, uh, but uh, the cardinals are charming, and they don't go far from, from they're all they're always within their their breeding territory, and they don't leave it. So you got them, lucky you. <laughs> yes, I, I believe so too. And this is one of those species like the tufted titmouse that that is a relative newcomer. Uh, probably thirty years ago, you wouldn't have found a cardinal in Vermont. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. and now they're in probably in every town in the state. Probably. Do the yep. immature look similar to the female? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, don't you have a, a book? Don't you have a bird guide, Frank? You could look at. It. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know the answer, because but I wouldn't be surprised. But but uh, almost certainly that's the pattern. There's no way an immature bird is going to show off the male's bright uh, plumage. So it may be something with a tinge of red and, and brown and maybe some red in the beak a little bit, but and the body shape, you, you could count on those. So it probably is much like the female, but it doesn't hang out with, with, with mom and dad very much. Once it's full grown, you know, like teenagers, um, it's out of there. Um, that's, one of, that's the only way that cardinals uh, expand the range of the species is they, the, the the, the newcomers, the new, the ones that have, have are new birds, uh, young birds, have to go find their own breeding territory because they can't be in their parents anymore. And mm -hmm. so that's how the Cardinals probably arrived in Vermont slowly but surely but steadily um, over a period of about 15 years. Yeah. Okay. So, good and, question uh, though, Frank. Yeah, I asked because um, we've had uh, one male and what would be three female plumages, but it seems like there's a pair and maybe two kids. I, I think you're probably right with that because the two kids will not be there probably by, by June. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And a lot of bird species uh, actually do extend their, ter their range, not their territory, but their, but their range, which is the entire map that, that they cover. Um, a lot of bird species will do that simply by, um, by having the youngsters get out of here. It's true of great blue herons. You sometimes will see great blue herons flying north in, in November because they gotta go find their own territory. And a lot of other birds do the same thing. Raptors are likely to do that as well. 
But these birds are like that because they are fixated year round uh, in a as a couple in their, in their local territory. And they're so dedicated to that. They don't want to go to party with a bunch of other cardinals. They don't want to go hang out some other place just to visit over in say uh, Marshfield. They don't want to do that. They want to be here. And the young ones get the boot. <laughs> so, okay. Well, now here's, uh, here's one we've seen already. And uh, uh, this is a bird that you'll, you've all seen probably in the last, uh, if not the last week, at least in the last month. And the, the American goldfinch um, is a bird you'll see any month of the year here in Peachum. Uh, but that's one of the cool things about it is you can watch how quickly its plumage changes, particularly mm -hmm. the males. And this is, this is almost certainly a male. Uh, it's a winter one that, that uh, has plenty of yellow around the head and um, uh, chances are it's a male. And uh, I don't think I could distinguish them very clearly in the winter but this looks like a male to me. And if you were watching this, that very bird for a couple of, well, I would say maybe, maybe five weeks, you would see bright yellow, not all of it bright yellow, but it would be, turn, it would be changing its plumage, molting and, and growing fre fresh plumage, the show off plumage. <laughs> this is not a, a goldfinch that didn't get the show off plumage but this is we talked about how closely related this bird is to the pine siskin and when frank when you mentioned you saw a bird that you thought was a sparrow i was afraid you were going to say pine siskin but a lot of people mistake this as a pine siskin as a sparrow but it's not it's a finch and uh, it doesn't have a sparrow bill and uh, and it, when it molts it shows bright yellow in the wings and um on the edges of the tail as well so pine siskin will be more colorful come April or May. Any questions about this bird? I hope you're, you will see, look for these winter, spring, summer, and fall because, because this is a bird that, that often is here in large uh, flocks in winter and only in, in uh, small uh, family groups uh, or pairs um, in the coniferous forests of, of Vermont. So. So you might get a lot of them this year, uh, still with another month or so, and then you won't get much after that of the pine siskins. You might see a couple. They're living here. Uh, some of them are. Okay. <clears throat> this is a quiz. Give you this one. The name isn't there. Purple finch. Yes. Purple finches. This is two purple finches. Um, the female below and the male above. Actually, it's three purple finches. If you see the tail of the other one behind the behind the cylinder, <laughs> so the three birds there. But we, we it's two two males and a female, and she never acquires uh, uh, any of that raspberry color, uh, but she does have distinct marking that you can see in the males beneath the 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 wash of the of the red uh, in their in their breeding plumage. So kind of interesting to see, have, you know, know that they both carry the same pattern, but the male has, has this red, uh, reddish tinge um, uh, in the winter and right through much, most of the rest of the year, but there is a break uh, when they have, to, they have to molt too, so. Okay. Mm. Oh, come on, Lydia, we talked about this one. Red Paul, that's right. And um, that's the handsome one, very handsome bird. And the, the, this, is a, this is a beautiful picture of a red pole. And if you're lucky, you can get your own beautiful pictures of red poles because first of all, they tend to hang around in the wintertime uh, in small flocks, anywhere from five to 50, uh, perhaps in an apple tree uh, or near where they're visiting your feeders. And if you're pretty patient, you might get some beautiful pictures of this beautiful bird the same way somebody else did. Very handsome. The black chin is, is uh, part of the field marks that you need for this bird. The red, red little tiny red cap, um, and the, the red on the front is, it washes from very, very pale to very deep as like the color on the head, depending on the birds, just, that's just genetic, uh, but they are all red poles. So it's interesting, but I hope you're seeing them. And everybody here saw them this year, this, this week, right? <laughs> no, yeah. yes. 
<laughs> okay. Well, you saw these then, right? You were looking for the yellow ones, huh? <laughs> no, okay. I don't see these till later in the spring. Well, that's interesting. That's a very interesting observation because they've had, we talked about this last week and they've had a really wicked up and down in their population in, in New England. And uh, the point that you see them now and you will be seeing them in spring uh, is, a, is, a, is a clue that they're breeding here because these birds, when they first um, blanketed the Northeast and, the, and, the, and the, all the, all the uh, states around the Great Lakes, the evening grosbeaks slowly but surely spread all over that territory over several years. 50 years ago, you would not have seen them at all. And, and, but about 30 years ago, they were all over the place here. And that was probably, a, this is what the theory is anyway, they could find wild foods and they could also find uh, uh, bird feeders. And they were so grateful, hey, this is good. So, so they hang out in groups, families or, or more. I've had about 25 of these. And some of you probably know uh, Tom Berryman, my colleague in mm -hmm. New Audubon. Tom uh, had a photo, had a video uh, of 200 evening gross speaks right in his front yard. <laughs> uh, so they're here and not all of them will stay here. Most of them will head back to um, uh, Northwestern Canada and Alaska, uh, but some of them will stay here and breed in the, in the coniferous forests. And you'll know they're here because they'll be brightly colored like these, or you'll know they're here, they're here because you can hear them. They have very distinctive voices, uh, evening grow speaks. Any questions about these? Did anybody see these this week? No. Oh, I did, I did. Good, all right. Good, you should, because <laughs> they're here now. Yeah, so is that you, Leslie, back there? It is. How are you? But I'm not in Peachum. I'm in St. Johnsbury now. Well, you're 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 entirely all right because I think we have probably two Peach, two or three people from Peachum or the, the immediate uh, neighborhood. But we got other folks who are a little bit further away, and that's fine. That's fine. But the point is that you got to get acquainted with the birds that live near you and why and enjoy it. Uh, okay. So here's one that that very few of us see very often. And uh, it is a what? Pine grosbeak. No, oh, red. Yes, a red crossbill. It's a, it is. Oh, a, that's a crossbill. It is neither of those. This is a white wing crossbill. Ah. And uh, so those are both good guesses because the pine grosbeak has the same color and markings, but it doesn't have the cro cro crossbill. And it's a little bit different in shape. It's a little more sleek than this guy, and also has different habitats. And the red cross bill has no white wings. And uh, so uh, those are interesting observations. But um, remember that these birds, that, that very odd beak that they have is there for scissoring open uh, cones on coniferous trees and digging out the seeds in those cones. And in in, in, in that's what they feed on. And uh, the interesting thing about this and, well, I've got to go forward and then I'll come back. And this, the red cross bill, mm. these two, this is the bright colored one. This is the drab colored one, but this one's a little bit larger. And uh, I think that probably this one's a little bit, I, I had been thinking that this one was a little bit more familiar in the Northeast Kingdom, but there, these guys are all over the place this year. The red cross bills are all over the place, including on my road, uh, right on the road eating the grit there. So anyway, the cross bills are fascinating birds. And you, if you see one, make sure you make a note that I saw cross bills, because that's the kind of information that might be of value, if not to um, the great backyard bird count, but or maybe useful to uh, birding neighbors, bird, other people in the community would love to see them and or know where to go, look, go to find them, that sort of thing. Look in the, mostly you see these guys um, near the tops of pine trees, this one. And this one uh, usually tucked into hemlocks and, and, and balsam firs and uh, sometimes relatively low and shrubbery as well. But, uh, but the crossbills are fascinating birds and uh, uh, this one has a long trilling sound, and this one has a bunch of pit 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 sound. And uh, 
uh, they're distinctive. Okay. So, okay. So here is the pine grosbeak that somebody said, oh yeah. See the coloration is just the same with the white, white wing, white wing bars and the, the darkening uh, face and uh, the raspberry color all over on the male, uh, the female of the pine grosbeak. These are these are fascinating birds. These live way up north, north in Canada and uh, Alaska, and they don't show up here every year in any great numbers. They've been quite abundant, and they came early. They came in November this year and uh, they've stuck, stuck around. Um, they have a lovely voice. And so if you hear something sound like it's singing a nice song in the top of the trees, I wonder if those are pine grosbeaks and that's, then it's worth it to get your, your binoculars and, and try to track down that sound. Pine grosbeaks are um, quite handsome uh, in both male and female plumage. Um, and uh, they're often together uh, in, in breeding pairs. And sometimes you see small flocks of them, but, uh, but like most of the other finches, um, they, uh, they eat grit and they eat seeds and buds and occasionally insects when they're here, but um, that's what they have to find wherever they are, pine gross beaks. I have a question about those. Yeah. Um, are they different colors of red too? Because some seem so brilliant red and then some not so much. We, th yeah, that's a good point because I have a feeling that it's not just genetic, it's also about age. I have a feeling that a mature uh, male, say of three or four years, would have a lush bright red and that the first year males wouldn't quite develop that yet. And uh, the females don't show any, any red, they show sort of an orange uh, around the head and the rump, mm -hmm. but, but that's about as colorful as they can be. So I think that that's a very good question, and I I'm only guessing that it's that it's age. Um, we have a huge flock of them that come in a couple times a day, great. and they they're all different colors. It seems. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I can, I I don't see a lot of them uh, recent. I haven't seen a lot of them recently. I've seen them in, in small groups. But you're right, and there's no there's not a firm uh, defined uh, uh, pattern of the color on the bird. And they could also be in a different uh, phase of molting. So uh, the, their plumage will change every year at least twice. So when do they molt then? Well, when do they molt? Typically, yeah. they would be molt mol molting in the spring. Um, and uh, uh, I'll try to answer that question. Uh, when do they molt? Uh, I have I have material on my on my computer that I could find that. For you, but uh, but I have to dig it up. So when do the but, but not you, now, but not no, now, right? I can't do it right now, but uh, I'll so let I you know. The birds are, shouldn't be molting now. No, they shouldn't be molting now. But some of them actually start to show that we're kind of losing some of what they've been carrying on winter because winter is is rugged on their plumage, and they may start to molt. I mean, I do think that I've seen. I've, I think I've seen, not this year, but in previous years, goldfinches molting uh, in late February. And um, that's partly the stimulation of, of conditions, uh, uh, weather conditions, climate conditions, food supplies, and those kinds of things. And also um, uh, the population of the, of the species, wherever they are. All those things could, could have something to do with, with when they molt. But the, the, the information I have in, uh, about every bird species that, that has to molt, um, there's, a, there's an extended period on a graph that shows you that they could molt in, in March or they could molt in May, and then they got to come back around and molt in maybe September or, or maybe uh, November. And it's that kind of thing. So, so definitely a seasonal. And uh, there are some birds that, that uh, molt, their second molt, uh, quite quickly after their first one. Some of the shorebirds do that, but you don't see a lot of those in Peachum. <laughs> okay, good questions. Oh, great questions. I'll see what I can find about when the pine grosbeaks uh, uh, molt. And uh, I'll show, actually, I'll try to send you a, um, that very, it's a very interesting chart that shows you what, when they molt, when they migrate, and when they breed. I would love to know more about that too. Um, okay. I've 
I've always been casually interested in birds. And then we found a lost parakeet outside. So I've learned a lot more about pet birds very fast. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just amazed that any wild birds can survive molting. Yeah. Because my pet birds are so, so miserable. Well, and pet birds are interesting because they do they do eventually go through a molt because their feathers get beat up in an, in an enclosed uh, situation anyway. So, Emily, where are you? I am from St. Johnsbury. I'm Lydia Harvey's daughter, and I'm actually in Massachusetts oh, at right. the moment. We are hoping to come back to the North Country. Okay. Well, I invited her to come. Well, she's, of course perfectly welcome and I very uh, much home and ask, so. asking good questions too so yeah so you, it's just my my pet birds they're so sad and they act really sick for a long yeah. time and I definitely thought they were dying the first time they molted and right. and I just am amazed at the more I understand the bird physiology I'm just the more amazed at the wild birds yeah um th th that's a really good Good question, and I don't know much about uh, domesticated birds, cage birds, uh, but I do know that they they have to be treated well, otherwise they don't live very long. And if they yeah. are treated well, they'll live forever. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's largely diet with them. Yeah, so we're yeah. and then we're trying to convince them that new things are food, and they don't believe us because it's so <laughs> it's so about what they're conditioned to think are food. And mm -hmm. mammals, you can be like, well, this smells like food, but that does not work with tiny hookbills. They don't really have much sense of smell. So they're like, no, that's a rock. <laughs> well, those are those. So I just wanted to say about this, about this, this graph that this calendar graph that you see that is in, in this, in this thing I have on my computer, on my computer, every bird species has the our circular graph and it's a calendar of 12, 12 months. And they block out um, some of them for molting times. And that usually is twice a year. Then the other thing that they, that they mark out, mark on the, on the calendar is, um, is migration. And that's twice a year. Um, and then the, the most important thing that is, that is almost always in the same place um, on the graph that, that each, each member of that species uh, lives with, and that is breeding. And so the reason those are in different places on the, in the annuals graph, annual and the annual life of a bird every, every year, a bird every year, because every one of those things, molting, migrating and breeding are energy consumption in every bird. And so they can't do two of those at once. And so, so typically they go through, if they're molting, they're not doing anything except hanging around. And uh, if, they, if they are breeding, they're not gonna be molting and they're not gonna be migrating if they're breeding. <laughs> that would be awkward. So anyway, any questions about that? I'll try to get that out. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if I get from, from, uh, from Susan, all of your emails, I can send this stuff to you. And I will. Um, that would be very helpful for me because I so I don't have to scribble every note on my little pad. But uh, anyway, that'd be great. So what are we looking at here? Junko. Junkos. Junko. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and the full name of this particular one is dark eyed Junko. And uh, there are uh, um, there there are several different species that are dark eyed juncos or 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 subspecies I should say. And this is a handsome bird, and it is a sparrow. It is, uh, is and we talked about that last week. Juncos are sparrows. You watch the behavior, you say, "Oh yeah, it behaves like a sparrow." They typically uh, feed uh, in low vegetation whether it's on the ground or in shrubbery. You don't see a lot of juncos looking for something to eat by flying off the top of a tall tree. They don't do that. And uh, because of their, their um, dining habits, um, they can usually find food wherever they are. And um, that means that they can stay here as long as they want or leave whenever they want to. But the junco is, is a very, very cool uh, uh, sort of, um, um, very tidy little bird, and uh, they have a variety of vocalizations, which are worth worth getting acquainted with too. Okay. Are they here all winter? 
they are here all winter. They're here all year. But that's the one I get. That's another one that I don't get till later in the winter. Like I'll get either at the end of February or into March. It's like a pot. Huh. It's not that the ones go away that are here, but then I get finches and yeah. um, the juncos. Well, it could be that the, 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 the juncos that you see in the winter are not the same individuals that you see in the summer. Summer, They are not necessarily mm -hmm. um, this, uh, you know, just hanging out here year round. It's very possible that the, that the juncos that come in numbers um, late in the autumn uh, are birds that, that were way up in the northern boreal forest yeah. and are, are here now. And uh, so that's possible. And then um, it's also possible that a few of them hang around. So, so they're, they're, the species is here, but not the numbers are here. And I think that's a good point somebody was making, a very wise point. Yeah. Okay, let's see. This is a sparrow, and so is this. Mm -hmm. This is the one with the wrong name. <laughs> the tree sparrow. It's the, yeah, it's the American tree sparrow is its name. And, and you wanted bird, to call it the Canadian shrub sparrow. That's exactly right, because, <laughs> because that's where they live, except in the middle of winter when they drift on down and where they think they can find more to eat down here in the winter, and then they head right on back. And they are not tree birds. They, they, if you see them anywhere in Peachum or any other part of New England, they will be in low shrubbery. And uh, that's all they've got in, in their home in Northern Canada, just all this shrubby stuff. So hence I think Canadian shrub is, uh, shrubby is a good name huh, for this bird. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very handsome bird and they have a pretty sound too when they sing. Uh, and uh, they usually are here in small flocks and that's a treat uh, because they are all chattering. Um, so, um, look for them uh, because this is they, they are they are uh, I would think of them as as a bird that you might see if you also see uh, the uh, uh, the snow buntings which I haven't seen I haven't seen many of those this year but some people have yeah. so anyway blue jays no question if you if you didn't ra if you didn't see a blue jay this week raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, don't oh know. I can't get away from them. <laughs> they, they have, oh, go ahead, Charlie. They just chase everything out of my uh, out of the trees where my bird feeders are. Oh, well, yeah. it's interesting. In the last week, I yeah. mean, I always get blue jays. They sort of intersperse during the day, but in the last week, it's it's usually the ch chickadees are around all the time. Now the blue jays are really active. They're covering this tree behind the house and they're at the bird feeders and nobody else will show up except the woodpeckers. The right. chickadees <laughs> and nut hatches don't come down. And then about midday, the blue jays take off. And that just started in the last week, mm -hmm. that pattern. Well, you might see them again um, later in the day as well. Um, and uh, that's, Basically, uh, you're absolutely right. They, they show up in, in, in a flock, uh, usually after the sun is up and there's, there is sunlight that will keep them warm. And uh, they will probably be uh, gathering their, the food that they're going to store um, <laughs> um, later in the day when, when they also want the sun then. So, uh, you, don't, they, you know, there's a lot of racket that they make even in the middle of the day, but, but that's just chatter. <laughs> well, they sort of compete. That's when the squirrels, I have these fat yeah. squirrels I've never had before. Yeah. They are obese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they are really this year. Yeah. And it's like, it's the blue jays and the squirrels in the morning. The squirrels are so bad. They crawl up my windows and look in the house. Yeah. I've never yeah. had this. I've always had those little tiny red squirrels, but these gray squirrels are like huge. Well, this raises a very important uh, issue uh, regarding bird feeding. And um, I learned the hard way that the best place to put your feeders is at least 20 feet away from any window, any place on the house. So they should, you know, put them on branches or put, a, put a, a stake in the ground and hang a feeder on that, but at least 20 feet away from the house because they won't slam into your windows. 
they won't be be likely to get all bent out of shape by their by the rival uh, that they see in their reflection because it's 40 feet away and um, so so um, it's good for good to have your feeders a little away from the house and the squirrels uh, are not going to be peeking in your windows if, if they're at your feeders that way anyway God, they're awful <laughs> yeah I, I have squirrels you know I, I I have a one dog and she has one activity that excites her and that's chasing squirrels so all I have to her name's Jesse and uh, if I look out the window and under the or on the feeder 20 25 feet away there's a squirrel and I say hey Jesse and she goes squawking right to the door get me out of here <laughs> and she gets everybody gets exercise the dog and the squirrels but they do get back okay sorry all right the woodpecker were a migration question yes I heard on on VPR that in the spring if you go out at night and you cup your ears you can hear birds migrating absolutely have you actually heard them at night? Oh yeah, yeah. There a lot of the a lot of the the songbirds, the passerin birds, um, uh, the ones that we think of as pretty little birds in the woods um, the, that migrate. They and the shorebirds are almost all nocturnal migrants, and the reason they can and do is, first of all, they don't want to get snagged by by a predator so migrating at night is safer but they also have wonderful maps in the sky that's tells oh, them where to go and uh, and the third thing about it is it's a lot easier to find food if you're on, on the ground in the day than it is at night so so it's actually they, they migrate a lot of birds migrate nocturnally uh, especially long distance uh, birds so uh, that's something something that that it's worth thinking a little bit about because if you do hear them at night, you say, mm -hmm. oh, and sometimes some some people that I don't, uh, you know, I won't talk to, um, think they recognize the different chips and peeps that they hear in the sky. So, oh, there goes a bucket, you know, whatever it is. I say, yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway, it is true. And it, it st it'll start in May. I mean, start in March. And uh, it'll get rich and richer and richer by the middle of May. It's going to be like crazy here. And uh, yeah, you should go out any clear night. If it's cloudy, they're not going to be as 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 busy in the sky because the map is covered. But um, yeah, sure. And, and is it like do you have to wait up till midnight, or is it you know when no, the sun? No, no. It, well, that that depends in part on uh, where they last stopped over. I mean, let's say, let's say uh, instead of Peachum, um, we all lived in St. Johnsbury and, and there's a great place along the Connecticut River between Hanover and St. Johnsbury that where they could get their last meal in the daytime. Then, then you know, you, you might have waves of them coming north. So, so you're not going to get them all at once, but uh, yeah, they'll be at it all night. So it all depends on where they get stopped over. And uh, also it depends upon their speed and the altitude, the lot of different heights in which they fly. And that's why some of the, some of the tall mountain top uh, towers are, are, um, are not so good for some of the migratory birds. Anyway, good question. It's hard to see them, that, but those do have all, every, every tower on a mountain has a light, every, every, um, every, every tall building in the cities has have lights. They have to have lights on the top. Okay. So Charlie, here... Charlie. Yes. Can I make one comment going back to the squirrels? Of a course. friend of mine who lives in Wheelock just told me today she has a barred owl uh -huh. who hangs out at her bird feeder in the daytime. <laughs> and a couple of days ago, that like a bullet that a uh, barred owl caught a squirrel. Yes, I've seen that too. Um, and uh, I watched, we've had a barred owl that would come and hang out half, uh, all the all daylight uh, near our feeders. Uh, and if the ground was covered with deep snow, that's good for the owls because both the red squirrels and the mice and, and other little critters that are tunneling through the snow they didn't know the owl's there until it gets them. And he, that owl was always knowing where they were gonna come out. 
which was right underneath the bird feeders. So, so yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting dynamic. And because we don't think of owls as daytime hanging out. Uh, but I'll tell you, there, as, as winter rolls on into March, more and more people are going to see barred owls at the, near their bird feeders. Because if they're, if they're desperate about food, they'll go after the birds too. So, but squirrels, they can have them. As far as I'm concerned, yeah. Now uh, the had a barred person... owl at our feeder a couple of days ago in Monroe. Oh, oh, is that right? Cool. Right, where are you in Monroe? Uh, Copper Mine Road. Yep. About the middle of Copper Mine Road. Oh yeah, yeah. That's up in the hills there. Yeah, it's yeah. the the edge of where it becomes completely forested. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice area up there. Okay, um, now for woodpeckers, um, there woodpecker. Well, obviously, um, we saw this picture last week, and you get a get a good glimpse at at Woody Woodpecker now, uh, who uh, is actually uh, I think eighty years old now. Um, <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah. So the the thing about these woodpeckers are these two woodpeckers are non migratory. We talked about this briefly, but but. This means a lot to to birds like these because because um, some of the woodpecker peckers migrate, the um, the flickers migrate, the um, oh another one migrates. What is it? Yellow bellied sapsucker. They migrate. You don't see them in the winter. Uh, every once in a while, you might see a flicker uh, on the on one edge of the winter, but you will not see a sapsucker in the winter. The one on the left is, of course, the big pileated woodpecker. That's a male, and you know that because there's a there's a broad white stripe underneath the chin and the bill, and it has the bright red crest. Well, the female has a, a smaller red crest, and um, some some males actually have red uh, on the cheeks as well. But that's a male, and uh, they are wonderful. The guy on the right is uh, everybody knows that one, it's the red-bellied woodpecker. <laughs> Another one of the newcomers to Vermont. And uh, most, most people who look, look out for birds don't see these in Vermont. But once they're here, they're like the cardinals. They don't go anywhere. And I know they've been in Monroe for about 30 years. Uh, and uh, the, down by the river though, not, not up on, on Copper Mine. Yeah. and. Uh, and the reason for that is the, is the climate down by the river so much more um, comfortable than up in the hills. And so the, that, that's, where the, that's where the cardinals were as well. That's where the mockingbirds were. That's where the tufted titmice are, down by the river. And they're slowly but surely not just moving north, but moving up. And uh, the red-bellied woodpecker is a good example of that. This is an interesting bird because um, it'll eat just about anything. They'll eat insects, they'll eat seeds, they'll eat fruits, they'll eat buds, they'll, they'll eat garbage if they find it. But but they're but they're you know they're they're fine that way. And they once they've established their their breeding territory, they're not going to move. They're like the cardinals. They're the cardinals of woodpeckers. There you go. <laughs> Charlie, I got a qu question about yes. woodpeckers. Yeah. About three years ago, I was driving up the Danville Peachum Road and I was north of Harvey's Hollow. Yeah. Right in front of my car, right over across the car was um, a red headed woodpecker, which they're not up here, are they? And it was um, winter. It was winter. I almost drove off the road. I was so startled. Well, let's go back to that picture. No, it was not this. It was everything on its head was red. Uh huh. Well, I it, came right home and got the bird book out. Well, I have. I'm not questioning you on that, but but the chances of anybody seeing a red-headed woodpecker anywhere in Vermont any season is just about down to zero. But well, that's not, what I. I mean, that's what I read, and, and yeah, but I'm and sure you, of what I saw. So you are very very fortunate. And it was I, gorgeous. I, yeah. It was a gorgeous bird. Yeah, they are. And uh, yeah, and you didn't bump it, did you? It just flew across, right? <laughs> it flew right across. I mean, it was really, a, no, I did not bump it. I would have gotten out and picked it up if I had. It's actually among the family of, of woodpeckers. It's actually quite quite re closely related to the, to the, um, to the red-bellied. You wouldn't know that just by looking them side by side, but a right. lot of the habitat and behaviors uh, uh, are, are similar. So, 
So, um, and uh, this guy is not a woodpecker. Charlie? Yes. Have, yes. Do we have black backed woodpeckers in the winter? I see mm -hmm. them in the summer and fall. Uh, yes. In Barnett. They, they don't go anywhere. Um, okay. They are, and you, the places you see them, black backed woodpeckers, the places you see them are typically in uh, swampy conifer forests um, with a, a lot of open space there. Uh, even open water there, and uh, they they are very happy there. That's a habitat that is very common across uh, across um, uh, boreal Canada. So uh, we are on the on the southern fringe of blackback woodpeckers. It's a cool bird, and yes, you can go. You can see them if you know where to look. You can see them over at Victory Bog. You can see them uh, up um, near the. Oh, what do you call the, uh, oh, what is that place? I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, this is a bird that, that I love to see because it's a little tiny bird, the brown creeper. Brown it's, creeper. It, it, it blends with the color of the bark that it's working on and spends all day on the bark of a tree by cycling up the tree. And then when it's done on, with that tree, it goes down to the next tree, it comes up. The, and um, the brown creeper has a beautiful little voice, but it's a tiny little bird. It's the only creeper in North America. There are lots of them in South America. And uh, it's worth seeing it. It's worth watching it. And uh, they're, not, they're not shy. So you might see them close. Okay. Crows, uh, large, large <laughs> roosts of, of large numbers of birds in one location are called roosts. And crows do that in some, some of our more urban places, including St. Johnsbury, and they can be really noisy. They're very different from their close relative though, the ravens, um, which is in the upper right-hand corner there. Um, and uh, it's, it's important to be able to distinguish the two. Crows are about, half the size of a raven and uh, the raven has other features that you would want to notice and in that photograph right there you can see the fan of the tail and that is important to notice and the thickness of the neck and the bill uh, those are clues that it's a raven the deep <coughs> calls are clear uh, clearly raven calls for me um, so I just wanted to have you look at these because lots of people mistake one for the other because the big black bird. Well, uh, the raven is closer to the size of a vulture than it is to a crow, uh, but it's not a vulture. Okay, I didn't want I didn't want to deal with vultures in this in this discussion this evening. But we well, remember these these two hawks that are so so familiar to one another, but they're different species, um, and this is a very odd. Uh, uh, thing because they have the same plumage patterns almost and um, um, they are slightly different in size. The one on the left is a Cooper's hawk. The one on the right is a sharp shinned hawk. And uh, I mentioned last week that the that the in the raptors, the female is always larger. Owls too. She's bigger. And um, the males are smaller. And the, the theory of why they're not the same size, the theory is that two different sized raptors can catch two different kinds of food, kinds of prey. And so uh, my point is that the sharp shin hawk, which is the smallest of this group of, of hawks known as accipiters, which means they're bird chasers, and he's got one. Um, but um, the sharp shinned hawk is the smallest of them. And the cooper is not the smallest, except when it's a female sharp shin dealing with a male Cooper's hawk because there's actually an overlap of size because they look so much the same. Um, they're not the same, but you, there's some very fine differences, but their sizes overlap a little bit between the female Sharpies and the male Coopers. Uh, their vocal uh, activity is different. Um, the shape of the tip of their tail is different. Um, the, the appearance of the neck of the bird, particularly in flight, looks different. The cooper is, has, a, has a more stretched out neck when it's flying. It has a, um, well, he has a deeper voice too. So anyway, those two. And then there's this guy. We heard this guy. Mm -hmm. 
he wants to hear more about you, but here are two <laughs> of our winter winter owls. Um, we have four, but uh, but these are the two you're most likely to encounter, the barred owl and the little tiny saw, saw wet owl. The other two that are here, great horned owls. How many of you have seen a great horned owl lake lately? No, me neither. I've seen great, horns out, great horned owls in Vermont twice in my life. One was in, uh, one was on the uh, Thaddeus Stevens Road, uh, in, I guess it was in Barnet, but uh, no, no, in Danville, just south of the covered bridge. And then the other one was uh, in uh, over, oh, Near the near the Connecticut River, on a in a pine stand, and there was a flock of crows there making all this racket. And I went in to see what they, they were yelling at, and this great horned owl flew right over my head. I said, "Whoa, okay, see you." <laughs> okay, and then there's this then there's this predator, and we this is this is we talked about this last week. This the northern mm -hmm. shrike. This is a bird that lives on the stumpy, stubby little birches and firs and spruces, especially, um, all along the tree line of Northern Canada and Al Alaska. But they drift on down into the Northern states um, for prey. And because up there, they got lemmings galore, but down here, uh, a lot of the small birds have disappeared for the winter and the lemmings are under the snow. So here they have some other choices and when they find a choice, they had too much of a mouthful for, for a shrike that's about smaller than a robin. The shrike uh, uh, stores its food and pecks it away on, on the thorns of a hawthorn or some other spiky uh, tree or shrub. And these guys, these guys are amazing to see. And they have a variety of sounds that they make as well. Has anybody seen a shrike in recent years? Mm -mm. I, I usually see about one or two every winter, but I'm always in the car. Oh, there's a trap. And, and I know I've seen one because they sit on the tip top of these of the trees so they can see as many predator, prey to the, as a predator, as they can see as many prey as they can. And uh, yeah, they're interesting birds. These are beautiful birds and uh, they're wax wings, but they are two different species here. and. Uh, who's going to tell us which is which? On the left is Bohemian. Yes, yes. And on the right? Cedar. <laughs> Cedar, all right, you got it. Good, good, good. Well, and this is not, they're not comparable in, uh, in, in, that's in the pictures uh, in terms of size, but you do see the colors. And um, the distinct, distinction between these two birds is substantial. The Bohemian on the left, remember, has a rusty uh, patch uh, beneath the tail, has a lot of rustiness in the face. It has white spots, big white spots in its wings. And um, it's a larger bird. Um, they both have yellow bands on the tip of the tail. They have a little yellow in the, feather, in the wings and they have the black mask and chin. But um, the Bohemian is considerably larger and their lives are in totally different worlds. Bohemian waxwings are from far northwestern um, Canada and Alaska. Uh, and they only drift on down here if they are looking for food. And usually they come in, in, in flocks. And the food they're looking for is fruit, small berries, um, uh, even larger fruits if, they can, if they're, they can get their bills into them. But small fruit is what they really would like. Um, and uh, you know, winter berry, which is a bright reddish um, orange berry that we have in, a, in the woods is a favorite of these. And then um, the, the cedar waxwing is here year round. And uh, they are much more versatile in their dining. They eat berries, they do, but they also eat things like, like um, um, uh, small insects uh, and, uh, uh, that they find. And that's good for their, for their protein and because they need the protein in the summer when they're breeding anyway. So, okay, bohemian waxwings on the left and cedar on the right. They're both beautiful birds. So if you see waxwings, Make sure you, you know which one it is. That's the trick. <laughs> That's the key, key thing that, that a birder would, would pay attention to. Okay, and uh, I mentioned these guys a little while ago and everybody knows snow buntings. Have you seen them this year at all? Yes. Good. Uh, 
where I live now, if anybody knows where the Sylvain Farm is, yep. in St. Johnsbury, right up above the Price Chopper, yep. uh, they, there's a flock that comes and goes all the time. That's interesting. I've, I've seen them three or four times this winter already. Well, that's great. That, and I'm, 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 I'm obviously not timing things well because I come down off the hospital road, drive down to the price chopper uh, from, the, from the interstate. And I'm always looking and I, it looks like a great place for them. And I've never seen that flock there. So maybe, maybe they know I'm coming and they just don't want to see me. So, but I love the snow buntings. They're beautiful birds yeah. and they're striking, striking here. They're also striking in the Arctic where they live uh, most of the year. We have them, Charlie, in the bird refuge. We've seen them there and we've seen them in our field along the um, Peachum Hollow Brook. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Well, I, you know, I've seen them. I've, I, <laughs> they came to, came to the bird feeders next door to us a couple of years ago and they, there was a good flock of them. Then. So you never know where they're going to show up and what they decide they want to eat and where they have to get their food. So, so this bird, this is a pigeon that weighs about, uh, what, eight, 10 pounds? No, this is a pigeon, <laughs> <laughs> this is a pigeon that's full of air. Um, this is a pigeon insulating itself against a cold wind. And uh, it's quite handsome in that posture, in that position. But all the birds have, have the layers of different kinds of feathers. And, and the ones, the, the contour feathers give the bird its shape and, and shield, if you will. And the insulation is all uh, in layers underneath that, such as with this bird. And we, fi we figured what this out, what out, what this was out. Last week, we got it all figured and everybody recognizes it now. Mm -hmm. It is a chickadee, <laughs> and they they have to do this. I, the key thing about this bird, chickadees, it, about them that you need to know is how desperate they are to stay warm, and to, to how to have enough food to produce interior uh, heat. And uh, and if they run out of fuel, they're not going to survive the day. And if you don't see chickadees early in the morning, you say, I wonder where they are. But I know that they are eating. And, um, and so I'm always out early putting that food out for the, in the feeders and the chickadees find it in no time. You know, and they come and sit, sit on, the, on the feeder while I'm filling it. <laughs> or they come and walt waltz around on my feet while I'm on standing on the ground on filling it. Uh, they're, they're totally tame. And uh, they, that's one element that they need is food early, 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 and frequently during the day. Um, and the other thing they need is shelter. Hey, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, uh, I was given a gift of three uh, little baskets. They look like uh, Oriole nests. Yes. They were intended to provide cold weather protection for little birds like the chickadees. Are, are you familiar with those? Yes. Uh, I am actually, and in fact, that's one, re I mean, that reflects, Frank, uh, what one of the laws are that protect the birds. And that is you cannot go out and collect abandoned nests. You can't collect them. And because birds may need them for s at least partial shelter in the winter when they're not breeding. So, so yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And sometimes, sometimes the, feet, the, the bird nests that are abandoned um, may be filled in by, by mice, depending on where they are in the, in the, in the trees or bushes. So, but anyway, so, that, so, so did, you have, did you have the birds uh, uh, getting comfortable in, that, in those dangling nests? Yeah, um, I saw them used a little bit, but it seemed to be, rather than the winter. I left them up year round and uh, they were very popular in the summer. That's cool, that's very cool. Yeah, and in that picture, if you hadn't seen it before, the other picture in, the, in, the, in mm -hmm. this one, uh, we had an argument about how many bluebirds are in that. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't agree how many there are. And I can't agree every time I count them. Sometimes I say, oh, they're nine. No, wait a minute, they're 11, <laughs> you know, or they're 13, but they, all those bluebirds are alive and warm. Mm. And nothing, 
page, you know, they're in a hollow tree. They entered through probably a woodpecker hole and some, and probably somebody discovered there was an opening at the top of that trunk. And these then, oh, look at all the bluebirds. And they, the birds wouldn't budge because they need to be warm. So it's one of those mm. things. Very resourceful. Okay. So uh, <laughs> as we know from last week, there are several birds that will use the snow as a, as a shelter. And uh, one of them is the rough grouse. And if you've been out walking in your snowshoes long enough, you're going to spark up a, a rough grouse that was uh, buried in the snow, uh, comfortably buried in the snow, and come busting out of there. And, and uh, as long as you scared it out, it'll go find something to eat. But that's one. And then the other one that we don't, we don't see uh, uh, very often in the snow because, uh, um, because in, at least when they do that, it's almost always uh, way up north where they spend most of their time, the red poles. Okay, so I, I, did anybody see a rough grouse this week? I did. All right. Just this morning. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's yeah. wonderful. They, their population, I think, has been, uh, has been uh, affected by um, the turkeys. Well, think what we got, we got. Okay, so um, the uh, yeah, <laughs> the big guy on the stump. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what these guys are, or those guys are, or that guy is. I mean, it's showing off. It's you know that what, that you should get its name from it. What he's showing you. So. Yeah. <laughs> Right, Jan? Right. <laughs> All right. Golden crown. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, it's one of the little kinglets, and they are charming little birds. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then there's. Did you read these... all about kinglets in, uh, oh, what's his name? Bernd Heinrich's book mm -hmm. on animals in winter. Yep. He has yep. many, many, many stories about kinglets. Yes, I know. Yeah, I, I haven't read that in a long time, but uh, yeah, you're right. Um, okay, this is, are you going to see, I will show you the names of these birds because you're not going to see the birds very often. Let's see. Oh, it's, uh, snowy. Yeah, snowy owl. How about that one? Remember? It's a rough-legged <laughs> hawk. Good hawk. Beautiful, beautiful hawk. And they come in black phase and light phase. That's a light phase. This is the largest owl in North America. You're very unlikely to see one in Peachum, but it's not impossible. Um, they will drift south uh, across the border every once in a, about probably Probably if the conditions are really bad in the, in the say the, the Quebec uh, forests, they'll, they'll drift down here a ways, but they don't want to come very far. The great gray owl is about, it's about almost three feet tall. So not from the feet, but from tip to tip, tail to the top of the head. And those big discs around those aisles, eyes, looks like it makes it look like he's staring at you no matter where you are. And then there's also this one. Okay. Frank knows this one. He's, he's being very polite. The Northern Hawkeye, Hawk, <laughs> Hawk Owl. Um, Northern Hawk Owl is an owl and it has a lot of habits and appearance and, and anatomy that suggest it's a, it's a hawk, but no, it's an owl. Look at that face. Um, and this is this bird I've seen, I think three times, two or three times in Vermont ever. And you can see one probably once a year if you wanted to drift over to Addison County and knew where to look in the middle of winter. But Northern Hawk, uh, oh, very, very cool bird. Yep. Okay, so the message here is that message. Um, uh, this is reinforcing so the barred owl who says, whoo, 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 whoo. This bird is say, at once to know who is with us tonight and who was with us last night, uh, last week. 
and uh, so that we can stay in touch because we uh, right locally we could have a, a group of people who are just swapping stories of birds that they're seeing and there's nothing more more fun than that if you don't want to make lists or tap tap it out in an account uh, uh, in on the computer don't bother just chat it up chat it up with people okay because I'd love to hear from you again so that's yeah that's all this stuff so this is my point and if you want to reach me uh, and you'd like to talk about birds, uh, here are two things that you could scribble down. Or uh, if I have your e email, I can send it to you. My email and my phone number. That's my house phone. My cell phone doesn't work in my house because we don't have any cell service there. But my house, my home number is, is, is easy to act. Uh, but I'm not often in the house until about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, because I like being outside. And uh, so four to eight is a kind, fine, fine time if you want to call and tell me what you've seen. If you saw six uh, crossbills in your driveway, I'd love to hear that. And I'd want to know where and when. Uh, that's the sort of thing we're trying to keep the conversations going. So, so don't hesitate. And my email, once you, once you get an email from me, you got my email address and you can send me any message you want with that, okay? Hey, hey, Charlie. Um, hey, Frank. I just uh, wanted to mention there's a great listserv that's based out of uh, uh, the Hanover area called the Upper Valley Birders. Yeah. List. Yeah. And why I find it so useful is it's kind of a preview during migration times of what's going to be here in Peachum area about a week after they show up down in uh, Thetford or, or, or uh, Dartmouth area. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, that's so a great know, point. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a good, that's a good one. Yeah, I think I probably know some of the people down there, but anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the, I, we, do, we did this uh, not by um, really deeply involved birders, People, everybody who puts out a bird feeder stops to look and see what's there. That's the kind of thing that we want to be talking about with people because uh, a lot of people don't know what they're looking at sometimes and they can call me up and say, well, it looks like this. Oh, okay, well, let's look in the book. Well, this is what it is. Um, but that's that's the kind of level that we wanted to make sure that, that we could welcome anybody. A lot of people who really enjoy the birds and don't necessarily know what they're looking at are missing an opportunity to really share their 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 pleasure and so that's what this is intended to be okay and you're right frank and uh um that kind of information is great for everybody uh that's on, on the call today i need to understand that frank is a big serious bird bird man so this stuff is is really big stuff for him he knows all the stuff that i'm saying tonight and so but knowing things like connections with, with uh, others who are observing the, the migrations, uh, that sort of thing is, is great, great information. And you can hold on to it. Okay, any questions right here now? Hearing none, you've got my- Charlie? Email. Yes, ma'am. Someone in the chat asked, asked oh. what the prey that the shrike had what was that was that a vole was that a mouse Did yes i think know? it was a vole um yeah there's i do think it was a vole they're the ones most likely to be seen uh in snow they tunnel in the snow but they do come out and uh mice uh uh will go into the litter in the forest and that sort of thing voles are, are more likely to be uh, uh open open land uh, that like like lemmings uh rather than like the mice that come in your basement <laughs> but anyway yeah almost certainly of all i didn't look at look at it study it too hard and you know maybe it, all of its parts were there but i don't know but they do eat, and they also eat birds. They catch birds. And so sitting up on the top of the tree, of an open tree, and you see, say, a flock of red poles come by, you can bet the shrike can snag one. And that's the sort of thing that, that goes on with those predators. Yeah, good question, though. Anything else? Okay, uh, I got to find the chat button. There it is, all kinds I've, of chat. I've got there. one question before you yes. go. Uh -huh. um, about a week ago, I saw a bird, which was a hawk to my mm -hmm. eyes, um, 
soaring over a boggy area. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought maybe it was an osprey. Uh. And it was about three or four miles away from the osprey mm -hmm. nest down on the, at the small Monroe Dam. Oh, yes. I couldn't pick out well enough the markings, but I could just see that it was very white underneath, but there was some black around the perimeter of the wings. Yes. Yeah. And I saw that rough legged hawk and I thought, was that possible? It is possible. Yes. I mean, in fact, there are very few hawk species that size that you would see in the winter here. Um, the only other possibility, uh, depending on, how, was it high in the air or was it, it dead? It was high in the air and soaring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, then that almost certainly uh, the, the rough legged hawk. Yeah. Um, okay. The only one I could think of that might possibly have been that is the, um, oh, geez, I'm terrible at remembering things. Frank, the one that flies over the marshes, the, the marsh, what we used to call the marsh hawk, right? Northern Harrier? Northern Harrier, yeah. Uh, no, I, I know those. I, it definitely wasn't that. Oh, okay, because it was a bird. Yeah, well, that's probably what it was then. The rough legged hawk. And it's a treat to see them because uh, if you're lucky, you might see two or three. If you travel around some in northern New England, um, all, all winter, two or three. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah. You're very lucky. Good, good, good observation. That's terrific. It's not too far away from one of the chicken barns. Okay. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chickens are out these days, but yeah, yeah, they had that one patch of them that are out, but not not these days, yeah, right? because they don't want to want want to wander around in the snow. So yeah, uh, that that makes sense, and I go by there pretty often, so I'll take a peek. I'd love to see that rough-legged hawk. Yeah. So okay, great. That's what it, what you got. That's something to chalk up a pleasure for you. <laughs> yeah. Anything thank else? you very much. Oh. Thank you for being you. out with us. Yeah. Or in with us and headed out yeah. with us. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I'll try to do it. I'll try to uh, get out in the, in the spring for some, some birding uh, and invite others to join us. But, and uh, over there in Monroe, you had, uh, you, you have, you've had some good birders right there in the village year, year after year after year. And uh, just as we did right in Peachum, uh, but most of them uh, had a lifetime uh, 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 schedule of, of seeing birds and observing birds and knowing birds, and then they passed away. And we know of several of them uh, in Peachum and a couple of them in, uh, in Monroe. And so, Frank, I hate to think we're next. <laughs> <but> <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you all for coming out. It's great to see you, and I look forward to being able to stay in communication with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. It was a great evening. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. We'll see you. Thanks, again. Charlie. Okie doke. Good night, all. Good night, all. Good night, everybody. <laughs>